evening and welcome to our fiscal year 24 public hearing this Wednesday, March 8, 2023 <coughs> at 7 o'clock p.m. Please note we are live streaming on our YouTube channel and the recording will be available on our YouTube channel afterwards. I'll invite you to please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I would like to introduce our school committee members and administration in attendance this evening. On my left, I have Mr. Dean Marino, Mrs. Martelli, Mrs. Conrad Lavarento, and Mr. Powers, the acting superintendent. On my right, I have Mr. Fitzgibbons, Mrs. King, Mr. Dolan, Mr. Marrera, the vice chair, and I am Mrs. Holbrook, the chair. We also have in attendance this evening, Ms. Liz Berry, the Acting Assistant Superintendent, Ms. Tala Babalola, the Business Manager, Ms. Natasia Robishaw, the District Treasurer, Mr. Michael Schantz, the IT Director, Mrs. Judy McDougall, our Recording Secretary, and other members of the admin team are in attendance. In accordance with the rules of public forum as defined in Massachusetts Statute Chapter 30A-20 and with Bridgewater Rainham School Committee Policy BEDH-E, these are the guidelines we will follow for the hearing. First, please note that this hearing is for informational purposes and the school committee will not vote on the budget as presented this evening. At the conclusion of the hearing, I will entertain a motion to take the budget as presented under advisement. At the school committee meeting scheduled for March 29, 2023 at 7 o'clock p.m. in the library of the Rainham Middle School, the budget as presented will be considered and a vote will be taken by the full committee at that time. For the purpose of tonight's hearing, our budget subcommittee chairperson, Mr. Dolan, will present the budget. We will then ask our acting superintendent, Mr. Ryan Powers, if he wishes to add anything to or comment on the presentation. Following that, I will entertain any questions or comments from members of the committee. We will then ask for any public input. In conformance with the rules of public forum and our school committee policy, please note that any citizen wishing to speak before the committee should identify himself or herself by name and address. Our policy requests that each speaker limit themselves to three minutes. In accordance with the rules and with the permission of the chair, all citizens shall speak to the full committee through the chair and shall not address individual members or administrators. Any committee member may direct questions to any speaker through the chair in order to clarify comments of the speaker. All questions or comments must be related to the budget presentation. At this time, I would like to invite the committee members to take a seat in the audience, and I will now recognize Mr. Jo Dolan as the chairperson of the budget subcommittee to present the budget. Mrs. King? Um, just to clarify for the public, since this public hearing is a little bit different, um, this is a question and answer. So as normal meetings, we have a public comment period where we cannot comment or respond. For the public hearing when you're at the podium, as she said through the chair, we can answer questions. This is a, a question and answer time as well. Correct, as long as it goes through the chair. Thank you. Just make sure this works, okay. Uh, I will let everybody have a seat and then get started. <coughs> 
Uh, good evening, as Mrs. Holbrook said, welcome to the Bridgewater Rainham Regional School Committee FY24 budget hearing. As we make our way through the slides, I would ask, uh, I would like to ask you to jot down any questions you may have um, and hold them obviously till the end when we have our public comment hearing uh, portion of the meeting, I should say. As noted on each slide, there is a slide number. Um, you may want to jot that number down so if I need to go back to it while we have any of those questions, we can make note of what slide um, and therefore get there a little quicker. Um, to begin, um, it, I think it's important for us to start with a little background and some history of how we as a regional school district receive our funding. Um, as noted on this slide, the Student Opportunity Act transformed how funding is calculated for all districts statewide. You'll note um, on this slide, the last bullet specifically, uh, the act did set the state minimum aid to $30 per student uh, with the total target of the local contribution of 59%. Um, in FY23, the state minimum went up to $60 per student. Um, and this information and all information, if it came from a DESI source, is sourced down at the bottom of the slide. <clears throat> On this slide, um, you will see our funding come, how our funding comes uh, year over year. Uh, you'll see on the left hand side it's a, a step down approach. We start with the statewide foundation budget. Um, we receive a portion of that foundation budget and then that 59% local contribution uh, from our member communities. Um, and their 59% contribution is brought in on uh, income effort and property effort. Um, property and income percentages are applied uniformly across all cities and towns and to determine the combined effort. Um, so that is not something that's done um, it, town by town, that is uniformly done um, to keep everyone consistent. Um, the factors that work together to determine Chapter 70 aid, uh, obviously within the foundation budget, it's our enrollment. Uh, and it's based on the district's October 1st numbers. So for this budget, uh, our foundation number comes from our October of 2022 numbers. Um, uh, the wage adjustment factor and inflation. The local contribution is uh, the property value, income, and municipal revenue growth factor. Um, moving on. Uh, so it's important, again, that we acknowledge our member communities. I want to take a moment and uh, recognize the members of the town council who are here, Mr. Lindy, Mr. George from Bridgewater, um, and from Rainham, um, Ms. Riley from the Board of Selectmen, and Dr. Prewindowski from the Rainham um, Finance Committee. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I want to point out that the state minimum contribution is on the top line for each year and then the actual contribution from the member towns is below. You will note that each, um, each year obviously our member communities do uh, give us more than the minimum state contribution so we obviously acknowledge that and thank them for that. Um, you will notice in FY23 um, as per our regional agreement we have not received all of these funds yet as we receive those on a monthly basis uh, through monthly payments from the member towns. And then we have our district contribution. So that's the third piece of our foundation and those funds come from within our district itself. Um, so we have our fees which are rental activity and athletic fees, uh, Medicare reimbursement for certain uh, special education students, um, interest earned on investments and our accounts, uh, miscellaneous receipts, which include things like previous year funds returned to the district, uh, circuit breaker reimbursements help to offset the cost of special education, and finally our excess and deficiency, which is similar to our member towns. Um, we are uh, able to certify monies left on at the end of the year to our E&D account. Uh, the towns in similar fashion call it their free cash account um, where we as a school district call it our E&D. The monies left uh, at the end of the year are certified uh, by vote of the school committee 
um, at our March meeting. Um, and the money can only be spent out of excess and deficiency by vote of the committee. Um, this year, you'll note that the district will be taking $1.5 million from this account to offset the t assessments to the towns. Um, so on the next three slides, you will see how Bridgewater Rainham compares to our on uh, per pupil spend to our DART districts. Um, you'll note that DART, um, that the district analysis and review tools, which is the acronym for DART, uh, turns the department's vast amount of data into ver valuable, easily consumable information. Um, the DARTs offer a snapshot of districts and school performance, allowing us as users, um, as districts, to easily track select data elements over time and make sound, meaningful comparisons to the state or a comparable organization. Uh, please note there are two items here. DART districts can change every year and often do, and the state assigns those districts. We as a district do not select our DART districts and we do not assign the districts. Those come uh, assigned through DESE. Um, and to be clear, you'll notice that many of these districts are not necessarily our neighboring districts. They are throughout the state. So that's also important to note. And then on each of the next three slides, BR is highlighted in green and the districts are uh, sorted by student spend, which is the third column in. Um, we also provide some more details such as percentages of students that fall into one of the state's reporting populations. We also share with you the teach student teacher ratio. Uh, please also note that the student teacher ratio is based on October 1 enrollment data um, and the number of certified staff. Uh, this does not mean just teachers in a classroom. The state includes guidance counselors, speech and language pathologists, OT and PT. Um, all of them count towards the, um, the student teacher ratio. Uh, so you'll notice we were in uh, just above Dudley Carlton uh, in 2019 um, and in 2020. Unfortunately, we did slide into last place for the DART districts um, for spend per pupil and we actually unfortunately remain there as well for FY21. Um, you will note that our percentage of state reported population goes up year after year or remains the same. So this is 2020, um, again we're in the green, um, and then in 2021 we are again in the green. Uh, the 2022 numbers from DESE have not been released yet, that's why uh, we don't have a slide for that. So, so that's our history, a little bit how we get our funding. Uh, now it's time to look forward and continue to move the district uh, in a path uh, to do a path forward. Um, as Acting Superintendent Powers has reported to the school committee, we've developed a path of, to excellence for all of our students. Uh, and with that in mind, the student success plan and our path to excellence have been developed based on DESTI comprehensive uh, district review, uh, which we have done, uh, the achievement data, which is our state testing, and obviously our learning loss due to COVID-19. And you'll note that our budget is reflective of our collective commitment to excellence in education for all of our students. So um, with that in mind, on the left-hand side of this slide, you will see a list of staffing positions that were included in the FY23 budget and filled. Um, on the right-hand side, you will see the proposed positions for the FY24 budget. These staffing requests will continue to move the district forward on our path to excellence. You'll note uh, we have uh, two relative service provider positions, an instructional support position in STEM for a coach for teachers, uh, two special education teachers, one for each member community, a civics teacher to fill, fulfill our state mandated civics course, 
uh, two instruction, uh, two introduction, sorry, to, for, for, to foreign language teachers. Again, one for each member community at the middle school. And then 14 educational support specialists. Three for the Merrill School, five for the Mitchell School, and six for special education, which would be um, uh, used district wide. So with that, we also every year look at our 10-year uh, capital plan for op operations and maintenance. And the school committee has determined these projects to be included in the FY24 budget. You will note that each member town has a different list of capital expenses by building. And then based on student enrollment as of October 1st, 2022, the district specific capital is divided by member towns on the far right hand side of the slide. And then each member town, so Bridgewater is here, Rainham is here. Every year we also look at our five year capital plan for technology and the school committee has determined these projects to be included in the FY24 budget. You will again note each member town has different capital expenses based on uh, their their buildings and then the district wide capital again is divided uh, based on enrollment data um, as of October 1st of 2022 and we do a five year capital plan for technology because obviously technology is an ever changing um, um, field uh, so we only do a five year plan there and that is updated um, by our long range planning subcommittee. So we then have the breakdown by towns. So we show you um, with all of the staffing requests, all of the capital expenses, debt, uh, our, contra our contractual obligations, we present these numbers to you this evening um, as the FY24 budget alongside the FY23 budget so you can see the comparison. Um, so you have our assessment to each member community, our capital, our debt to make up the total for each member town. And then the total assessment, our state aid this year uh, did go up. Um, it was 29 million last year. Uh, it is now 33 million this year. Um, it did go up $3.3 million from last year. Last year we did get a $4 million increase. So we, we did um, see a increase in state aid. And then our local aid, which is uh, district funding, uh, and our E&D. So we will be taking that 1.5 million out of excess and deficiency, as we mentioned. And then we also account for uh, local receipts, which um, are fees and items that I had mentioned previously. <clears throat> so this is our FY23 verse 24 budget by category. Uh, you'll note that each category, uh, a state reporting category, um, is over on the left-hand side. These numbers are the state code numbers, and these are the category titles. Um, as a reminder, debt is held by the district on behalf of the member towns, so that is uh, down here at the bottom. Uh, you will note debt has gone down from um, last year, uh, last year to this year, there is debt coming off of uh, the roll. Um, the estimated per pupil spend down at the bottom, um, down here at the bottom, is an estimate, is an approximation because the state has not given us those numbers. So we as a district um, did what we could to crunch those numbers. Uh, they are not by any means certified by the state. So our our student spend with this budget goes from 14,800 per student to 16,078, uh, $73, sorry, it, which is an increase of $1,273 or an 8% increase on our student spend. The, the total budget um, did go up 9 million, uh, a little over $9 million and a total of 10%. So our total budget is $98,750,420. <clears throat> so 
So next steps. So on, as Mrs. Holbrook mentioned, on March 29th, we will vote to adopt the budget, the FY24 budget. Um, we will take uh, any feedback we receive tonight as a budget subcommittee and work this budget more if needed. Um, so we obviously encourage everyone to, um, to comment on it if you have it, if you have a comment. Um, and then in May, the town council will vote on the town's budget, which includes the school budget. And then Rainham's town meeting uh, will be held on May 15th. Um, some quick acknowledgements. Um, I'd like to take the moment on behalf of the budget subcommittee, um, Mr. Powers, Ms. Barry, uh, Ms. Macedo, who is our retired uh, business service uh, director, uh, Ms. Babalola, Ms. Robichal, Ms. McDougall, um, the administration team, many of whom are here, our principals, our assistant principals, um, the town of Bridgewater, uh, Mr. Dutton, Mr. Salmonte, uh, the town of Rainham, uh, Mr. Barnes, and uh, Mr. Mr. Lasivita, uh, the finance director. And again, acknowledge the town councilors and members of uh, the Board of Selectmen and the finance committees from Rainham. So um, we thank you for attending tonight, um, and I will. Um, turn this back over to Mrs. Holbrook. Anything you would like to add? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, just I, I want to echo uh, Mr. Dolan's comments about uh, the towns and their support. Uh, we had several uh, proactive meetings uh, with both towns. Um, they are always very beneficial anytime we can collaborate, have a better understanding of the you know, the financial situations of the towns, but also we can share with them, uh, you know, our asks and uh, our wants and, and our needs. Um, so th those meetings have always been uh, very beneficial and I, I know we'll continue to collaborate and work together. Um, I also want to thank the administration uh, that's in attendance, and not just for being here this evening, but for all their efforts in developing this budget. And certainly uh, members of the community and, and their, your support, you know, Mr. Dolan referenced our um, collective responsibility, we all do play that role in, in making sure our students are successful. Um, I think when we look at the positions brought forward, uh, they were done so in a very thoughtful way. Uh, we started the process back in the fall, uh, as early as October, when we started to talk about the, the needs of the district. Uh, Mr. Dolan did share what some of those uh, needs were based upon, uh, and, and obviously we looked at positions that we felt were going to have the greatest impact, uh, not just teaching and learning, but also uh, operationally. Um, it, because we, we have to balance that, you know, we, we do need things such as dump trucks and plow trucks uh, along the line and at the same time needing textbooks and uh, classroom teachers and, and the such. So trying to do that, uh, that fine balance is, is never easy, but we, we felt as though we put the, uh, the, our best effort forward. And, and again, uh, I think the budget that is presented tonight is, is fair and represents um, some of the needs of, of the district. Thank you, Mr. Powers. Okay, the floor is now open for school committee members. Mr. Fitzgibbons. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Dolan and members of the Budget Committee. This is a thankless task. It's a Herculean task, and I appreciate what you guys have done. It's amazing. We appreciate it. Um, just a few questions, just to level set, folks. Um, you, you referenced somewhere in here about a 41% state uh, aid level. But if we look later in the presentation, um, it, it's roughly a 33% number to the towns, to, to our district, because the towns go above and beyond the state foundation budget. Is that correct? Is that why the numbers don't quite jive there? So. State foundation budget, 41% state aid. Yep. Get there. 
What number two? Uh, three, sorry. <laughs> See, that's why I said it. Yeah. Yeah, don't don't <laughs> the slide number. I, I don't listen very well. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yes, that is exactly why. Yep. And so, and so then if we look further, further in, the state minimum contribution on page five, we're, we're roughly between the two towns, uh, somewhere north of $12 million above the minimum state contribution Correct. that's required already. Correct. Correct. Gotcha. No, I just, I just, I, I yeah. just want to level set people because yeah. yeah. if they go through it and they're thinking, oh, well, why, why did we say this when it says that? And yeah. Yeah. Bah, bah, bah. Okay. Um, so that, that said, um, it looks like it's about eight and a half to nine percent increase in assessment to each town. Uh, yes, roughly. Uh, yeah, roughly about that. Um, I can give you. The... I, I, I just want folks to understand yep. roughly eight, eight and a half to nine. Yep, actually, it's eight uh, eight point five nine to Ringham and nine point six three to Bridgewater. Great, perfect. Thank you. And um, and could you highlight any differences between? This budget versus the preliminary budget set forth by the, super, uh, the acting superintendent uh, at the last meeting. Sure, I think the the biggest piece is the the staffing request that Mr. Powers put before the budget subcommittee, um, and and knowing uh, what we have faced in the past and working with our member communities and what they're facing as communities and and how long it took all of us to get our Chapter 70 funding uh, numbers this year. Um, that is, I think, the, one of the biggest um, changes is the sheer number of, of staffing that he uh, presented to us and that we bring forward to the committee this evening. I, I'm just looking for a number, sorry. Oh. Uh, um, you know, are, are, we, are, are you, the budget committee, recommending a bigger number or a smaller number than the, super, the acting superintendent? Suggestions. Uh, yes, it's a smaller number. Uh, during, smaller. during the preliminary uh, presentation uh, back in January, I really presented two different scenarios. One that was basically every asset we had, and that uh, equated to about 82 total positions. We also made the efforts to start to reduce that down as part of that presentation. Uh, so we uh, reduced that number down to 29 total positions, and I know Mr. Dolan presented a budget tonight uh, reflective of 22 additional positions. Okay, great. Because I, I remember I remember that discussion, Mr. Powers, and you know we talked about whether that would have been the ideal situation or just a good situation. And I remember Mr. Dolan talking about, don't be surprised if the budget committee comes back with a higher budget. So I, I'm just I'm just saying yep. you, you did not in fact come back with a higher budget. Correct. And, and just to clarify, a higher budget than we usually come in with. Okay. So okay. I, I didn't. My, I, I, I I made. I thought it was coming in. No. You thought no, it no. might come in higher than the acting superintendent. No. No, so. no. no. Okay. Great. That's all my questions. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Marrera? Uh, Madam Chair, through you to Mr. Dolan, um, I know the, at a first glance, the increase is, is pretty drastic. It's probably taken some people, um, you know, off their toes a little bit. I just wanted to understand, uh, what if there was just a, a turn the page budget? Um, I know that's always a, a topic of conversation. What if we don't hire anybody? What if we don't do anything? What if we don't? Uh, spend any money on on capital expenses because um, I, I want I want to make sure people understand that yeah. uh, it's not just taking this year's budget and it's the same next year. There's still contractual obligations. Yes. So, so what does a turn the page budget uh, look like? So a turn the page budget to, for the district would be about two million dollars. Um, and again, to your point, that includes contractual obligations, um, health care. <coughs> I, things like that that we we have some control over with our contracts, but then healthcare costs we have very little control over. So it's it would be about a two million dollar increase with none of the positions that we've proposed this evening. So that's none of the positions and none of the capital expenses being done. Correct, because capital is is, is separate than uh, our operating budget. So capital in, and debt are separate from our operational budget. So yes, you're right. That that would that two million dollars is to just turn the operational budget page, if you would. 
Yeah, but I just, I just wanted, I just wanted the public to understand like some of these things that we have in here for capital requests. Um, you know, there's parking lot pavements. There's uh, restriping of parking lots, LED lighting upgrades, new shades at schools, um, plow truck, dump truck. These are all operational things and part of capital expenses as well. Uh, but a turn the page budget does not include any of that. Correct. Could I follow up on that, Adam Chair? Yes. Um, because if, if we're looking at um, page uh, 15, Mr. Dolan. Yes. Um, <laughs> it got cut off on my sheet, but that's okay. I, I saw 14 right before it, and I passed third grade math. Nice job. Thank you, Mrs. Cucinato. Um, <laughs> we, we see an increase of about $3.5 million in state aid that we're expecting. Correct. So to say it turned the page budget of $2 million is really shorting us because we'd be, we'd be reducing assessments to the town. It would be, yes. And so we should at least count on 35 I would expect. Uh, you know the three and a half million and hopefully a reasonable increase from the towns whether it's eight eight to nine or whatever whatever it comes out to be i think i think there's room to grow in this budget is what i'm saying yeah Mr. Um, okay thank you this is Madam Chair, um, Mr. Dolan, I have a couple questions. Um, sure. I actually went back and looked at the January budget. What percent? What was presented? It actually looks like this budget from the Mr. Powers preliminary, not the high budget, but the low, the, the lower budget. We'll say the A budget versus the B budget. This one looks about two hundred fifty thousand dollars more than that one does. So it's a little bit more. It looks like. My question though is around some of the positions from looking at what was in the preliminary. A budget versus this one. It, there's a little bit of change in some of those positions, so I'm just trying to understand. Originally in that budget there were 12 positions and now this one's 22. It looks like they're mostly ESPs, um, but I don't quite, they're not, it's not equal to equal, like, if that makes sense. So I'm just trying to understand the difference in the positions. So, yeah, and Mr. Powers, if you want to jump in here, please, by all means. Sure. <laughs> um, so we, as a budget subcommittee, looked at our, our enrollment numbers in first grade um, and, and are mindful and cognizant of our youngest learners and the impact that their education sets them up for the rest of their academic careers. So with that in mind, um, we know we have heard from folks that we add teachers at that level that's, that's not feasible for several reasons. Um, the largest is the space. You just don't have room to add um, a teacher at, um, or two teachers at every grade level. And adding only one teacher doesn't really make a, a big impact um, that people, I think, think that would. So if you have a class of 27, you add one teacher, you're really only going down by three students. It, it's, it doesn't have, that much of an impact to do that. So we thought it best to add a, another adult, um, an educational support professional to support the, the first grade teachers. Um, it is not one per classroom. It would be a shared, um, a shared model, if you would. So one ESP would be assigned to two teachers, um, one classroom in the morning, one classroom in the afternoon type of thing. Um, so that is the the biggest, I would say, um, change. Uh, and again, that is to make sure we've got our, our youngest learners who are in some larger classrooms, some more educational support. Mr. Powers, I don't know if you have anything you want to add. No, I, I would uh, agree with that, Mr. Dolan. Uh, you know, the benefits that we've seen from adding ESPs to our kindergarten classrooms uh, is evident. We're seeing the data to support that when we look at some of the uh, mid-year assessment data compared to kindergarten say last year um, students are you know averaging anywhere you know 20 to 30 percent uh, difference in in their achievement this year you know obviously we would like to think that there's a direct correlation between adding and increasing staff um, and then we obviously have the everyday feedback from the kindergarten teachers so it really we do feel as though that investment was was worthwhile and will pay us back not just now but in, in future years so if we can replicate that understanding that 
we'll never be able to replicate that at every grade level as we go up, but as you mentioned, certainly putting a focus on those early grades, uh, we feel as though if we uh, make a strong commitment there, uh, then uh, you know, it may lead to needing additional, less additional support in the upper grades. And one question. Um, in the budget, one of the big increases in items was the um, the programs with other districts, I mean, it went up a million dollars, but it's 36%. I was just curious if you can explain what that what, what that increase or what those programs with other districts are. Yeah, so that pro those programs with other districts, it's included of the, um, the state recommendation that we increase that budget line by 14%. Um, that is the, the special private special education, education school. Okay, that's what yep. that is. Okay, yep. that makes sense to me. Okay. Mrs. Martell, yeah. um, first and foremost, I want to thank the budget subcommittee because I know that task was huge. Um, second, the foreign language in the middle schools. I'm assuming that's inquiry. Uh, uh, Do we know? Sorry, let me just look here. Page 12. <laughs> if I may, since so this sure. is my. Yeah baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, I this was the that. sword that I fell on for the budget. So. <laughs> I have advocated for foreign language at the middle that. school level since I was on the committee. And as Mr. Dolan said, this is going to be something that we're going to have to go back and maybe make cuts between now and the end of the budget. Mm -hmm. And potentially that might be one of them. Um, but I wanted it out there. It's something that we feel that is important. I don't, we don't know what it's going to look like. That'll be an admin thing. Is it just eighth grade? Is it across all grades as just like an introduction to language in general and then try and move that to become an intro to language and move some teachers down? That's something that Mr. Powers has talked to us about, like how we move forward with that. Um, but we wanted it in the budget, even if it's not going to go through this year. Um, because we really want to move in that direction and we don't want to keep putting that off to the next budget cycle. Next year is not going to be any better. Right. So well, potentially. I'm for that as well. So, I, yeah. I so that being we're there. advocating for that and I think focusing, you know, we try to look at our budget and say we need that foundation in kindergarten and first grade. We need more special education um, positions. And we also need to focus on the middle school level, how we can put focus on there as well. Yeah. So we kind of try to look out where the needs are. I don't know if all of those will make it, but. And to add to Mrs. King's um, discussion also, was that the reason we also looked at the foreign language is that we were hoping to then have an AP class at the high school for Spanish. So that would give them the opportunity to add that course and right. that number. And if I could, Madam Chair, yeah, that wouldn't be something that would happen next year. That would be mm -hmm. several years ahead. Several. So just to sort of level mm -hmm. set it, don't expect an AP next year. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, you know, back in the day. Yeah. Right, it was. Mm -hmm. It was having the name and going to high school, you know, yeah. Spanish too or whatever. Yeah. But it did allow that that growth. So. Yeah. Mr. Dean Marino. Uh, <clears throat> what are the two related service providers that is proposed? Uh, so Mr. Powers, I'll let you speak to those. A absolutely. Uh, tentatively scheduled right now to be speech and language pathologists. Um, our um, speech and language pathologist caseload over the last number of years has increased and even uh, more so this year. So we, we just, we feel as though there's a need, um, you know, when we look at how many students they're servicing, uh, the amount of minutes that are required. Um, we just, you know, have realized that we, we need to increase that staff. Um, and so those, uh, they're considered related service providers, but it really is targeting speech and language pathologists. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Oh, yes. The two special ed teachers want to, <clears throat> excuse me, each town. Is that for sub-separate classrooms or is that just a special education teacher and the regular education inclusion? Sure, yes, uh, th thank you for that question. Uh, no, that would be, uh, right now, uh, the plan is that would be inclusion teachers, not uh, substantially separate, uh, adding substantially separate classrooms. Um, and, you know, obviously our plan is to, when we look at enrollment, um, 
you, you know, to have one schedule for each town. As you know, <coughs> caseload fluctuates from year to year, so it, it could be eventually that these two positions end up on the same town or a sharing grade levels, but really the thought was to help the uh, caseload on the Rainham side as well as the Bridgewater side. Yes, Mr. Dillon. Uh, I do also want to uh, thank uh, my fellow budget subcommittee members, Ms. King, Mr. Morera, and uh, yourself, Madam Chair. Um, as several of the committee members have mentioned, this, having sat on this committee for several years and now chairing it, um, this has been a challenging process for us. This was not an easy easy thing for us. We did hear from many of our uh, families advocating for positions and we took all of those into account in our discussions but when pen came to paper we had to make some tough decisions. Um, I'm afraid that we might be having to make more tough decisions in the next three weeks. Um, so I, I want to thank the three of you for working with myself and the rest of the admin team to, to put this together. Um, but that, that's sort of uh, <coughs> okay, Thank you, Mr. Dillon. Mr. Mr. Moreno. I remember my last question. Sure. Um, <laughs> and this is just to put into perspective, if you could just clarify it for me, because you understand a little bit better. Um, a lot of positions that we have put on over the last couple of years were part of COVID money and grants, correct? Correct. Uh, can you please just elaborate to the public on um, how those those grants have gone away and those positions have been rolled into the operational budget. I think that may help understand what the big jump is yep. um, in the overall budget. Yeah. So there were uh, several ESSA grants uh, that were released during COVID, um, and some of those allowed us to uh, hire staff under those. Um, and obviously, as those uh, funds run out or the program runs out, if we want to keep those positions on, we need to absorb those positions into the operating budget. Um, Mr. Powers, I don't know if you want to speak directly to what those positions were. Sure, absolutely. At a high level, Mr. Murray, that's sort of what we're, um, where the jump comes from, so. Sure, uh, just to give an overview, you know, some of the positions that you actually see on it are, say, the FY23 budget, such as the uh, School Adjustment Counselor at RMS, that was a grant-funded position uh, and obviously a much-needed position, but again, we were able to use some of our ESSER funding uh, to bring on additional positions like that. Uh, obviously, coming out of COVID and during COVID, we wanted to make sure our students were supported socially, emotionally. Uh, we added additional nursing uh, staff as well. You can see there two nurses on the FY23 budget. Those again were moved over from ESSER grants. The additional ESL teacher, those were moved over from ESSER grants. We were able to provide some additional special education support as well uh, through those ESSER grants. And, and so really, you know, we looked at kind of coming out of COVID and, and obviously the last year or two during COVID, um, you know, what positions should we try to maintain uh, that we felt as though there, the need still exists, that it just wasn't um, you know, a one-time ask, that these did emerge as important positions and, and much needed, and so therefore, uh, thankfully, the, you know, through uh, everyone's collective effort, uh, the school committee put forward a budget and the towns approved it last year to move a lot of those positions over. We still do have a number of positions currently that are being funded through ESSER three, um, and, and obviously, you know, our, um, initial budget that had the 82 positions included many of those positions that were grant funded if we could move a lot of those positions over to the operational budget that number was reflective of that so a lot of our interventionists are currently or actually all of our interventionists are currently being funded through ESSER uh, we really have after this school year one more full school year of funding but there are other positions that are um, you know charged to that grant as well so that funding is unfortunately coming to an end um, and you know we, we've benefited uh, greatly uh, from that, but yes. So I think those positions that we feel as though we need to keep, unfortunately, will have to be moved over to the operate, operational budget. Thank you, and, 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 and that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up is I don't think uh, a, a lot of people outside of this table here understand that some of those positions that we currently have are grant funded, um, and if they no longer, if they were to be end, you know, as at the end of FY23, and we need an FY24. The FY24 position side would be a lot heavier than it is right now, and that may come down the line 
in the next year or two if we want to keep the same staffing levels, if the public feels that the supports that we have in place are needed to be continued. So, but a lot of those things have been absorbed into the operational budget, but some have not yet. So it could be a, a you know, that's, I just want people to understand that, that big jump that we see about the $9 million, which is a lot of big sticker shock for a lot of people, um, that has been absorbed from previous grants uh, positions, so we don't lose those positions. Thank you, Mr. Moran. Mrs. Albert, um, I just want to make a comment, is because within the, the PowerPoint presentation, Mr. Dolan presented the DDAR district piece of uh, spent for our people, and we've all talked about this over the last few months. And with this budget, it puts us around $16,000 estimated per spent per pupil. I, I just want to just say out there, and I, again, I'm thankful to the towns and their support, but I just want to say what's here is 21. So towns across the state, this year's government budget in Chapter 71 or 70 funding went up 8 or 9%. So everybody else's funding is going to go up. So with the 16000 it's not going to move us in the middle of the d districts. So if I... We don't know yet, right. but, but everybody else is also is going up and their spend is also going up. So I, I would just, you're right, I don't know where that will put us Plus. on this list, um, but I would caution that everyone's Chapter 70 isn't going on. There are several communities that um, we've heard from that are not happy with the formula. chapter's funding, the chapter 70 funding formula because they've lost it state aid. So I, I don't dispute the where it would put us. I just caution the, the uh, everybody's number is going to go up. It's it's actually not. Um, there is a, I, I received an email from um, uh, one of the superintendents on the regional school district listserv and there was he was putting numbers together of, and I wish I had printed it, I didn't, um, so I apologize for that, I can forward it to the committee. Um, and it spelled out the, the percentage of towns or districts that are going up, and it's not the majority, so. But even with that, even if we looked at 21s and we got them in the middle, I, I would just like to say, if, if we actually got, we're at 16, we'll put us in the middle, when we got to 18, that's an additional $20 million for the district and what we could do with that money. And we talk about test scores, we talk about accessibility and all the programming our kids could have. Without funding, we cannot do that. And, and $20 million is a lot of money, would fund a lot of things. Again, we're moving up slowly, but it also, the funding also limits our ability to add all kinds of supports and programming within the district, like foreign language, if the funding doesn't come through. Well, nice. Okay. So next, um, I will open the floor for public comment, and we will give everyone who wishes to address the committee an opportunity to be heard. We respectfully ask that you be considerate and limit your comments to an allot the allotted three minutes. And the comments that you make or the questions you have, if they, they must be related to the budget that was presented this evening. We do have two people who signed up to address the committee this evening. Um, unfortunately, they did not give their names, but they I can give you the first three letters in their email address <laughs> <laughs> and that first one was APD so if you are in the audience <laughs> come on down and, and madam chair this yes. is actually interactive as opposed yes. to usual com correct. public comment mm -hmm. just so folks understand correct APD no I feel like we're calling off the plate number. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> like lights are on. Lights are on, exactly. Okay, the second one, again, just gave an email, and the uh, letters were CBR. You can come on down to the podium. <laughs> You're complaining? Yes. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, I did put my name. I don't know why I didn't show up. Um, oh. my, my name is Carol Ann Ryber, and my address is 273 Summer Street in Bridgewater. Um, I have a question. I hope this is an appropriate question around the budget for uh, next year. Um, I had a question about, um, you mentioned uh, fixing parking lots, etc. cetera. Um, can any of that money or potentially be thought about to fix the Bridgewater Rainham track? Uh, so we can, Mr. Powers, I don't know if you want to take that or if you want me to. Um, sure, I'm ha happy to. Uh, the school committee actually uh, voted and approved uh, last year for this current fiscal year uh, to make those improvements. So we are actually in the process. We've already gone out, uh, had a designer come in, a project manager come in. Um, so they uh, are working on schematics of improving that track. Our tentative timeline at this point is uh, they should be breaking, hopefully, ground sometime this spring. Um, and then we, it should be operational, not probably for the fall, uh, but certainly for the spring track team for next year to use it. And then obviously, as once it's done, the community will have you know, access to it as well. But that, uh, those funds were uh, appropriated uh, for this year. So they were not, uh, Bridgewater Rainham was not able to host any meets last year. Um, it's just not safe, uh, the track and the equipment. Um, and as again, you know, the track season starts in another two weeks. Um, obviously, it probably won't be ready for this season. It um, it's, a, it's a burden, not only other schools in the district, but also Bridgewater has to provide transportation. Um, it's a huge amount of kids that are on the track team. Not everyone can run a 50-yard dash, but some kids can throw a javelin. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, it's a huge amount of kids that participate. It's a great program. So I just wanted to um, ask about that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In tennis courts. Yeah, I was going to say courts. We, yes. um, the fund funds the were also uh, set aside to um, replace the tennis courts as well. Oh, great. Um, and I have a little bit of time left, so I just wanted to say a quick word about the um, foreign language program. Um, my son, my youngest son, is a junior here. Um, I do think it's definitely worth um, investing and taking a look at, not only um, for the middle school, but also the high school. He's on his third French teacher this year alone. Um, there Mrs. Mecklenburg should be back next year. <laughs> right, Angela? Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. Um, so it's not just um, the middle school, but also getting the kids interested in the foreign language is helpful, but also how do we retain and keep those teachers. So thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the committee at this time? Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening, Sean George, uh, Jillian's Way, Bridgewater. Um, through you to Mr. Dolan. Uh, great job, Mr. Dolan. Unfortunately, the slides kicked in my ADHD. So I just have a question. Can you give me the assessments without capital proposed for 2024 for Bridgewater and for Raynham? Sure. Uh, so the assessment for Bridgewater, uh, not capital, not debt, is 34 million. Six hundred and seventeen thousand five hundred and fifty two dollars. Okay. And the assessment for Rainham, again, no capital, no debt, twenty two million one hundred and twenty five thousand six hundred and eighty dollars. Six eighty. Thank you. Um, forgive my voice, I've kind of lost it, and I'm short. <laughs> um, Lisa Borgini, 11 Titicut Road, Rainham. I wanted to comment and just say thank you so much for increasing the amount per student that has gone up, um, but we're still in last place, and not all funding is equal. And I wanted to just remind you that on page 7 we saw that the DART district average funding or ratio, we're in last place for the last three years for teacher to student. And so if we're spending more money, but on page 12, you have less people getting hired than the previous year, we're still gonna be in last place. And there's no movement. And so I'm just asking what we can do to address that. And in particular, you'll see all the red shirts. We're all here with the BR Music Boosters. Um, we have 1,300 students in the high school plus, and one music teacher. 
1,300 students, one music teacher. I don't know about you guys, but when I went to high school, I went to a high school of 300 people, and there was a band, and there was a chorus. We don't have that here. We can't, we don't have a dedicated band, a dedicated chorus. And, you know, I feel very passionately about this, as do many people in this audience, and I just want to know what we can do, what would it take to get a second music teacher? And I, it's a legitimate question, like, what can we do to make that happen? I honestly don't have a direct answer for it. Um, I, again, we presented staffing that we had to prioritize. Um, and last year, we added a, a, a music position at um, the middle school level. Um, and, and when we look at the greatest impact or uh, what, what positions are gonna have the, the largest impact to the largest number of students, that's what we looked at this year. So we looked at, obviously for the special education positions, we have to do those by law. We have to meet those requirements uh, in order to be in compliance. Sure. But the other positions, so the ESP specifically, um, what's going to have the greatest impact to the greatest number of students? Sure, and, and I, I totally appreciate that. Yeah. But I also want to just point out that for many students, music is the access. And we're talking about kids with special needs, right? We're talking about kids with autism, kids with issues. Music is the way in. And if we don't have that, then we have to spend all this money on these remedial places where they aren't really part of the group. And so I, I just want us to think creatively, what can we do and what can we do as a community to support the school to make that happen? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to address the committee? Hello, my name is Maureen Fermanick, 20 Carat House Drive from Bridgewater. I would just like to um, echo how important I think music is, and it is therapy. And we're, when we're talking about coming out of COVID and social, emotional stuff and supports that students need, music can help with it and touch so many of those students some of those students can only express themselves through music. I'm sorry, obviously I'm not great at public speaking, but I'm very passionate at, with the music department. And I don't know how, I, I agree, how was one teacher doing this in this huge school district? So if it can't, if the, nothing can be addressed in this budget, I appreciate any creative thinking for maybe maybe a little bit in the next three weeks that we could squeeze something in, if not for years going forward, because I would hate to see another teacher get burnt out and lose another music teacher. I, I just, just, I'd love to see the arts and music program grow more at BF. So thank you for all you do and any consideration. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to address the committee? Hi, Elena Caranos, 120 Goldfinch Drive in Raynham. Um, sorry, public speaking, not my thing either. Um, but we're looking for consideration for a school bus for our neighborhood. Uh, about half of our neighborhood is over the 1.5 miles, but the other half is about 1.2 to 1.4 miles. We're asking for the school committee to prioritize the safety of our children. Um, we already have bus 42 that comes and picks up um, children from the neighborhood. The bus holds about 80 kids, but only carries about 40. Um, Locust Street is narrow, it's windy. We've been told that the chief of police has signed off that he can't recommend this walkway to be, this route to be walkable, as it's not safely walkable. There's no sidewalks, there's no street lights. There's no crosswalk, no crossing guard. Um, we're just asking that the committee consider letting 
the rest of the children get on the school bus. I understand that it may need a uh, chaperone for the school bus, and we would like to offer a suggestion of uh, parent volunteers to not pull from your budget because we don't really want to pull money from all of these great programs that you guys have talked about, but we just want to make sure that our kids get to school safely. That's all. Anyone else? Well, thank you all who came before the committee tonight to give your input on our next year's budget. Again, we'd like to thank Mr. Dolan and members of the budget subcommittee um, for all their hard work and acting superintendent powers, acting assistant superintendent Barry, our business interim business manager, um, Ms. Babalola, as well as Ms. Macedo, who has since retired. And our district treasurer, Mrs. Robichaud, for their hard work um, for this budget. I would also like to thank both the town of Bridgewater Town Council and the town of Rainham for working with us on this budget. Our next regular meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, March 29th, 2023, in the library of the Rainham Middle School at 7 o'clock p.m. This concludes our regular public hearing of the fiscal year 2024 budget. I will entertain a motion to take the fiscal year 2024 budget under advisement and adjourn the March 8th, 2023 public hearing at... Time? 8.02. 8 so moved. Okay, we have a motion by uh, Mr. Marrera, second by Mr. Fitzgibbons. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thanks, everyone, and have a